Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. This is a workshop evening. It's Thursday, November 19, 2015. Can I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massagill? Here. Dr. Mills? Dr. Miles, sorry. Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Ms. Hartle? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, there is. Um, the, it's a very simple adjustment. Um, it's a, uh, a change from uh, 6.0 being adjournment to instead um, announcement of a new school board advisory committee. And uh, the adjournment will move to item 7.0. Thank you. 4.0, new business agenda. 4.1, presentation of committee assignments. And I will take the liberty of doing that. Um, the board has just left a workshop session. And we have arrived at who will be on what committees and who will serve on what liaisons. And this is a wonderful board. We're all really professional people. And you all have great backgrounds that support these committees. The negotiations committee this year. Jackie Perry will be chair with Christine Massengill and Kelly Murphy serving. Policy chair is Kelly Murphy. <coughs> Kate Miles and myself will be joining that. For communications, Terry Lyford will be the chair, Jody Shea and Kate Miles joining. Finance chair is Jody Shea. Carrie Lyford, Christine Massengill will be joining. I will be an alternate on both negotiations and finance. For the liaison positions, teacher evaluation and professional growth, Kate Miles certainly has the background to be able to do, <coughs> to do that work. Health and safety will be Kelly Murphy. The facilities work will be done by Christine Massengill. Sebago Alliance, if needed, will be Jackie Perry. The vocational schools will both be Carrie Lyford and myself. The education and business partnership, I will take on that responsibility. Legislation will be handled by Jackie Perry. There will be an advisory board that we will be speaking to a little bit later on in this evening. And there will be a chair. Kelly Murphy will chair that. Carrie Lyford will join her in the organization of that. And we'll give the details of that for the public in just a little while. Those are the assignments. Thank you all for taking those on. And there was a lot of work involved. And, but I know you all do great work. So. 4.2 is minutes of November 5th. Do I have a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Are there any changes to the minutes? Any discussions, things that need to be corrected? Seeing none, all in favor? Six plus two. I see. That's right, okay, so, so it's yeah, six plus two, one abstention. 4.3, do I have a motion to approve the middle school co-curricular appointment? Approve is printed. Second. Any discussion or questions on those? You do have a revised um, sheet right. that Kelly has provided to you, so uh, I would work off of that sheet. It's just a minor revision. Any questions? You want me to read Dr. Intersel, so I see that there's one that's still a to be determined. So is this it then for the middle school co-curricular for the um, winter? So yeah, no. Oh, co-curricular, sorry. Sorry, um, I was thinking the Mr. winter. Mr. Gage is giving me the, sh 
the no sign. Okay. Any ideas for the middle school? How many more besides the one that's to be announced? And if you don't have I think it's probably just the one to be announced. Oh, okay. sorry. No, that's all right. Thank you. Do you want them named? Um, can we just take them as a whole group? I didn't know if the public wanted to know who was appointed. That's all. Well, if if we want to do it that way, that. we're going to have a lot of reporting <laughs> out. We'll make that list available. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions? Yeah. Are there any new positions here that weren't here last year? Are these all same as last year. They're the same as the last same year. The same as last year. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Are we good? All in favor? Seven plus two. Four point four. The motion a motion to approve middle school winter coaching position appointments. Approve is printed. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions about these appointments? Jackie? Just one. And they're all employees of the school department. Um, which uh, one are we talking about now? Winter middle, middle school coaching. coaching. Middle no. school coaches. No. 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 So, um, no. I see, a, I see a brand new teacher there, but um, not everybody is a, a staff member. Is that correct? Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Seven plus two. Four point five. Do I have a motion to approve the Wentworth School co-curricular appointment? Move approval. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Seven plus two. Four point six. Do I have a motion to approve the high school winter coaching appointment? Move approval. Second. Any questions? I, I just have one, and there's something that must be misnumbered somewhere in here because <coughs> the winter coaching positions on this sheet say 4.7. Right. Yeah, they skipped 4.4 4 in the yeah. uh, on this sheet. Anyway, it's no, just okay. the number eight. Yeah. But the sequence is correct. Any other questions? All in favor? Seven plus two. 4.7, a motion to approve the high school co-curricular appointment. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Oops, sorry, Jody. I just wanted to clarify for people, because it's not on this sheet that the asterisks mean um, funding by the boosters. Mm -hmm. Good point. It's, it's not footnoted here. There are still more high school co-curriculars as well, correct? We have more high school calculators coming. Mr. Legage. It's on the sheet. I thought we did high school calculators. We did it earlier. We did a bunch. Yeah, but I think we previously did high school calculators with a few resignations. So I'll have some more time with those positions that have been filled. Okay. Any other questions? So these two are not being appointed tonight. Yes. Yeah. They are being appointed. We did some earlier. Teacher Michael saying that a bulk of them were oh. hired earlier. Right. Anything else? All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. Five point oh. We're now moving into our workshop session. Dr. Francisco, will you carry us through five point one? in the audience, there's no dancing involved. <laughs>
this was created by our Nibe students. So you have to meet a little bit. But maybe there'd be some uh, the cool Dominican music yeah, in the background. A little bit at the end. Okay. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, I'm going to plug this in. Gabriella? Partnership is the University of Southern Maine.
seems so long ago when we were at that welcoming party. Um, welcome everyone, uh, all of our visitors. Uh, we'll just talk a little bit about the, the UNIBE uh, program. Uh, the UNIBE, Scarborough Schools, and uh, University of Southern Maine Partnership is really a very unique student exchange program. It affords uh, our three UNIBE students uh, who are enrolled at uh, the university in um, Santa Domingo in their uh, teacher education preparation program to come to Maine to live, to study, and to intern in our Scarborough K-2 schools, while at the same time earning 12 undergraduate credits that are essential to their preparation back home um, here at the University of Southern Maine. In exchange, Scarborough High School students will be provided with the opportunity to participate in a global study exchange experience in the Dominican Republic, and that's organized by UNIBE and the staff at the, um, at the UNIBE University. Tonight, we're so pleased to invite our UNIBE students, their host families, their mentor teachers, and the K2 principals uh, to share the experiences in our first round of the partnership program uh, that will be wrapping up at the end of this semester. Uh, before we invite our guests to share their thoughts, I did, however, want to advise the board that arrangements are underway for planning our first global study exchange for Scarborough High School students, uh, and that's to happen planned after school um, ends this year uh, in June of 2016. Um, just a little bit about that program because um, we're still putting the finishing touches on it. Uh, the program is uh, shaping up to be very exciting with an extraordinary opportunity for our, our students to focus um, their study on the ecosystems of which there are many in the Dominican Republic. They'll also have an opportunity for a 10-day immersion into Latin American history and art and culture, and for those who are interested, those students who are interested, they'll also be immersing themselves in the Spanish language. We're hoping to distribute brochures uh, to our high school students before they leave for Thanksgiving break, and we'll be holding some follow-up student and parent meetings um, after Thanksgiving. Uh, the size of the exchange is limited to 12 students, um, and we do expect that and hope that um, the slots will be filling up very quickly. Uh, this has really been a, a team effort to make our uh, first part of the UNIBE exchange work. And um, so I'm going to, uh, I think, start with um, I, I think I'll start with um, each student and I will go through their support team. Okay? So I think I'm going to pick team uh, JD first. Okay, and Team Team JD is has been supported this year by um, Kelly Mullen Martin, who is the principal of um, Blue Point School, Leah Lee, and Alec and Dan Jarvis, and their children Asher and Jordan. So there's going to be a whole number of people up here. I'm suspecting. <laughs> and or representatives thereof. And I just wanted to give a prompt to, to each of you, okay? And the prompt is, what surprised you most about this experience? We'll start with JD. Come on, you have to come over here. Okay. And speak. <laughs> oh, hi. And don't be nervous, you're on camera. Okay, on TV. I won. <laughs> Um, I think that the thing that most surprised me of this experience, the first time I get here, believe it or not, it was the time for eat, like the dinner time. <laughs> it was too early. <laughs> it's like we are um, used to eat a little bit later, like at 9 or 10 p.m. And yeah, it's so early. But you say that. It's just like a <laughs> nice experience. And my family teach me how to love the salad. I don't eat salad, but they teach me how to love it. <laughs> so it's pretty nice, and it has a been a really wonderful experience. My mentor teacher is just awesome. She just taught me a bunch of things, um, how to manage the class, how to behave with the kids, how to always smile when I have the kids. So she's, she's always funny. So she's super nice. And good. <laughs> good. Very good. Um, 
Lee? Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> We're always smiling together, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think what surprised me the most was um, JD just had a birthday last week and she turned 20. She is so mature. Uh, she's, a, she's like a veteran teacher. I learned so much from her. We learned together. She made comments about kids. I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And I, I really appreciate the experience. It was wonderful. So we're going to keep learning till December together so, <laughs> and smiling. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I guess the thing that surprised me the most was how easily all three of our uni-based students fit into each of our schools. They are just such lovely, wonderful, beautiful souls, and they just fit in seamlessly. And it was, it's been a real pleasure to have them in all of our buildings. Hi, um, I'm Dana. This is my daughter Asher, my husband Alec, and our other little daughter Jordan couldn't be here today. They're going to the event tomorrow. Um, what surprised us the most was that you didn't eat vegetables. <laughs> 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 um, and just how much she's become a part of our family. Um, and how easy and comfortable it was and how adventurous you are and willing to, your, your spirit of willing to just go for it and try it um, and always happy. Uh, and, and we've learned a lot from you as well as, you know, as far as just the type of teacher you are. We can really see that you're, it's just natural. It's a gift. Asher, you want to say something? Say something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything, that, anything that surprised you about J.D.? Anything you want to tell us about her? So that was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> surprise. You have a big sister now. Right. <laughs> Big little sister, we call her. Her Jimmy yeah. calls her. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Team uh, Beatrice uh, also has Kelly Mullen Martin as uh, principal, Kate Swinburne as the uh, mentoring teacher, host family Deborah McGill and her son Christopher. Um. Do you want to start off? Okay. Do we use the same time? Yeah. <laughs> What's the price? Well, I think that I've learned so much, like much more than I thought I was going to learn in all this, like in all different ways in life. In the way I really have been getting adopted, I didn't thought it would be that soon. And also, I like I really like the way the school system is and how organized it is like really really organized <laughs> and yeah and I've I've just learned like a lot a lot yeah thank you who's mom oh okay oh. <laughs> so um, what surprised me the most funny surprise is that she actually can walk around the house without being freezing um, I thought she would be miserable uh, this fall, but she's, she's hanging in there like a trooper. Um, I think what surprised me the most is, uh, I, w I guess I would echo your comments, Dana, Donna. Um, there, she's very mature. She is an uh, amazing young woman and was, I'm going to get a little teary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard act to follow. I like it. Yeah. Um, one thing that really surprised me is how fast B came into my classroom and was just ready to go. She helped the students right off the bat. She was ready to just jump in with them. Um, there was no time of timidness. She was just ready. You could tell she felt very comfortable. She was very mature. And um, one thing that really stands out is how much I learned from her as well. It was an experience where. She taught me a lot of technology, <laughs> um, but I just felt like I got as much out of this as I hope she did. Good. Well, and I would echo um, how brave our teachers were. I mean, I, we really built this a little bit as we went, and they got a phone call late in the summer. You want to have a a student teacher from the Dominican? Sure. <laughs> and they've all just been fabulous and 
taken the risk right along with us and just been so generous and so thank you to them. Christopher, yes. what surprised you most about Mrs. B? Um, what, that she she read like, well, she didn't like my mom told me she was coming like three weeks in advance, so she was like she kept telling me constantly <laughs> <laughs> that she was like counting the days that Bea was gonna come. <laughs> and and like the funniest part of when she was here is like well there's a couple of ones like when <laughs> when when did mom got these <laughs> no no just no. He's, he's taking my extra time okay yeah. yeah 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 and and like we went to. Oh, Hinkley. Hinkley. No, not. Okay. <laughs> Hinkley Park, where they had that obstacle course thing. And oh, oh, the boulevard. Yeah. The boulevard, where you could where you could climb over the ropes and then climb back down. And, like, we had a contest who could get there first. We got down first. And I came in second place. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was the other ish, exchange students were with us though. Okay. That was pretty good. So you uh, you beat one out of plus three. my book got stuck. Oh, uh, well, that explains it. Good thing. And you. also <laughs> she kept reading. She read the stories when like. The, from her second grader, she would read the stories they did. That they wrote? Yeah. Yeah. Mom Pretty tell good. one of the stories. Yeah. They were funny. We need to let them get away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. That was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Team Gabriella, um, with our principal, Ann Lovejoy, uh, our mentor teacher, Andrea Wood, and Amy and Bob Daniels as uh, the host family. Hi. Well, the thing that surprised me the most was that this program was very flexible. We get to do all the things, but it was very flexible, and that was very good. And other thing that this place is very peaceful compared to the Dominican Republic, to the place where I live. It's very peaceful, which I like that. And the other thing is that you have an amazing staff. That's why I learned a lot from all of them. <laughs> um, I'd say what surprised me the most, other than the fact that someone can be cold, like really cold at like 56 degrees, <laughs> um, <laughs> really cold, <laughs> um, would be that she is very, they all came to us and they were such a gift and they were so brave for being 19 year olds to come to a country where the language is not the same as theirs, they're not with their families, but they found families here and they found a, a home for the time that they were here and um, I was really surprised how much she learned and how much she gave back to not only just myself but to my class or our class and um, she made such a huge impact on our on our on our class she really taught from the heart and used the love that she has and that she was born with to be a teacher to really connect with every single student each and every student and it was so wonderful because she brought her culture into our our school, all over the place. The music, the sounds, the smells, the excitement, everything came into my classroom and the kids just soaked it up. They learned Spanish words, which they just can't wait to share with their families. And um, the impact that she had on the students was, was huge. It really made the students grateful for their education that we give them here and everything that they have. And I think that that is priceless, to expose 
these children to other cultures is something that I think is really special and I am so appreciative for and uh, I am so thankful for my friendship that I have gained. <laughs> That's hard to follow up. Um, I have two that I was surprised. One was how well they speak English. <laughs> I was <laughs> expecting a lot more Spanish to be spoken around the home. So we have not learned any Spanish because it's all English, <laughs> but it's been fabulous. Um, and the other thing is, to piggyback on what Annie said about be her being cold, she has not been in shorts once, <laughs> and we were in the upper 70s, near 80. I thought that was pretty warm, <laughs> and it lasted a long time, but we have been in pants. But she is now walking around the house with her winter coat on. <laughs> 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 but she did warn me that she's always cold, even at home. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I'd like to say what surprised me is the effortless, just everything seemed to flow. Uh, you know, you open your house up to a stranger, and I don't know who was more nervous, her or us, but we've, we've come from being strangers to friends to really family. Um, we've Skyped with her family down uh, in Dominican several times, um, and it's, uh, it, it's been a great joy for us. And uh, I would encourage people in the future to do this. Uh, it's such a wonderful experience for, for both sides. And uh, um, in her defense, all the girls did go swimming in our pool this summer. So they weren't that cold. And the water was only like 72. So, um, so in, in their defense, they're not that bad about the, the weather. So, but it's but it's uh it, it's been a joy. We we've got to meet and know the other two girls as well. Uh, wonderful young ladies, uh, very good representatives of their country. Um, and I know any that we send down there will do do us proud as as well. Um, it's, it's it's such a wonderful program. I, I just uh, we have many many memories, and uh, we are going to continue uh, a very close relationship when she does leave. And uh, we're already talking about making uh, a trip down there to visit her and family and, and the country. Um, so it's, it's just been a very, very positive thing. And to see how they've uh, interacted with not only us, but with the other host families and the teaching staff, everybody has learned so much from this. And uh, I, we do know that she does like ice cream. Uh, <laughs> I think my wife taught her that. Or, uh, <laughs> so, but uh, it, it's, it's been a pleasure, and I want to thank the girls uh, personally for all the, all the joys that, that you've given us, and thank you for giving us the opportunity. So, thank you. Well, what surprised me the most, I think, was how quickly we came to really count on Gabby and to think of her as just another part of our staff and not as a guest and not as a student teacher and not as somebody who is just learning from us, but somebody that we can count on to take over a classroom on an emergency basis or when we needed, didn't have a sub filled. You know, we knew she could be there, we knew she could be counted on, and we didn't have to worry. So she was, you know, just instantly ready to be a full-fledged member of the staff and, and not just a, a guest or a, t or a learner. So we are so happy to have her and we're so sad to see her leave and um, hope that she sends all of her friends soon so that we can have more people in the staff and, and we'll, she'll come back too. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I will invite our, um, our student teachers up in just a moment because the board may have questions for them. Uh, but I also wanted to, at this point in time, in, um, introduce to you Dr. Kathy Falona. Um, Kathy and I have been, have been partners. Um, Kathy is, is um, the USM partner, and she and I have basically overseen the academic part um, through the university. Uh, with these young teachers, and I wanted uh, Kathy to have an opportunity to say hello and, and to uh, share her thoughts. So um, I think it was a little over, it was a little over a year ago that um, George 
started to engage, that George and Joanne started to engage the university in this conversation in terms of becoming partners. And um, I was kind of charged with trying to help make it work. And it's been such a great experience. That if, one is because, you know, as you heard, these young women are wonderful. And they, um, I didn't get the prompt, what surprised you the most? But I think, like as Kate said, you know, it's one of those things where they just jumped into their classrooms and they grew the, I had the opportunity to visit them at various points during the along the way and they grew so much but they were mature they were self-directed and they just put so much effort into getting to know the children and to doing the very best job they can be and I concur with everything everybody already said they will just make wonderful teachers one day and then you know from our part on the university as others said it was just effortless really on our, our part I mean we you know walked in and we provided sort of the academic coursework but you know the teachers were there to support them on a daily basis and they were really the ones driving their learning and I felt like George and I were there to offer support but um, it was just a privilege to be in their classrooms and um, having a little small piece to take part in and um, I would say just on behalf of the university I mean those are exactly the kinds of partnerships we want to have with school districts you know engaging in meaningful ways that help out and support our communities to do what they want to do. So Thank thanks you. George. Thanks. So this is uh, this has really been just a great a great success. I had never really imagined a level of success like this. I had certainly hoped for it, but um, uh, it's you know just again to say um, what appreciation we have for our mentor teachers who really just just jumped into this with both feet um, with our for our host families that really opened their hearts and their and their homes and. Um, and, and those two pieces are just so absolutely critical to make this work because the only way that we can create an affordable program uh, for our 12 students to go and explore ecosystems in the Dominican, um, which is something I would have signed up for in high school, um, is, is, to, is to really um, ensure that we've got uh, the kind of professional supports um, and the kind of family and housing and and food, meal support, uh, to, uh, so that, so that uh, this is actually, this program ends up being a wash on both sides, which is, which is um, uh, rather unique. And the fact that we have college students and that we're sending high school students who will have um, a, an early college experience as well, they will be, uh, they'll be enrolled at UNIBE during the time of their visit, um, is just an extraordinary opportunity for many, many folks. And, and the relationships that have built, uh, Kathy and I, uh, the relationship that we have built with the students, and all of the other relationships that you've heard of have just been really very positive and, and, and really um, it, it's been uh, joyful to be a part of uh, all of that. So I'm going to ask the, um, our NIBE students to come back up one more time because I know uh, generally that our board likes to ask a question or two. Am I right? Come on up. Are there questions from the floor? Oh, Christine. Um, so, ladies, I'm not certain because I don't think you we were ever told. What year at the university are you in the Dominican? So, how much schooling do you still have left before you would become uh, certified teachers? This is our seventh semester. So, we have two years in the college. We need one more year, one semester. To finish One it. more year and a half. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, finish. And, and do you hope um, to stay teaching in the Dominican, or are you hoping that perhaps there might be opportunities abroad for you to teach here in the States or someplace else? Well, um, personally, I would like to keep growing. Keep growing. Like, um, I would like to be an ABA. I try to work with special need kids. So, probably keep learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, maybe I, I will have a time to have the experience there teaching, but I'm, I'm looking forward to come here and just keep it going in other areas. Yeah, that question, like a lot of people have asked me that. And I really don't know what I really want to, but I would love to. But life goes around, like, with many things, so I don't know. But, yeah, I would definitely love to keep growing, do keep studying and also 
teaching, but yes. Other questions? What what did you learn that changed your mind about something you thought about our country? A preconceived idea that you had about us. Well, that's a very inter interesting question. I thought uh, maybe the public schools, like how it's organized, is not what it like they we thought about what it is. It's not like a, cla a class where you're facing the teacher. It's not like that. I mean, we learned that it's just like getting engaged with the kids, listen to them or what they need, what they want, trying to be like kind of a different, getting out of the box. So it's just like that. Yeah, the public education is very different from the Dominican Republic and here. And the staff, I just saw that the staff will always just get better and better. They will have like meetings and they talk about the things that are that are they're doing and the things that are not and the things that they need to improve and just keep growing and growing. Um. I think that probably how nice people are here, but I think it's more because of the part of the country. Because, um, well, I've, I've, my entire life I've been like going to Florida, and one of the things that I saw that I saw, it was like people were pretty cold, and meaning like they wouldn't be that nice in general. So. I was thinking like, no, I wouldn't live here. Like, I would visit, but I wouldn't live. Like, I, I would like to just be around people who would say hello or give you a smile or be nice. And I think that has changed my perspective and made me understood. Like, it will always depend. Like, I know that everywhere is every kind of people, but yeah, that. <laughs> As we think about future years for the program, um, Question. Are there aspects of, of your experience here that were particularly valuable that you'd like to see preserved, and are, are there things we can do to improve upon the program for future participants? I think that you need to keep doing it, like just <laughs> keep <laughs> stay with it, um, being part of being a classroom, like being really part of a classroom, not just like, oh, can you please do the photocopies? No. I mean, just like get involved with the kids, know what they want, what they need, listening to them. Like being a teacher, and it's just like a server. So that part of the takeover way that we had, and the, all the all other things that we um, teach with the kids, it's like the opportunity to teach them how to live, how to how to struggle with emotions, how to be. I'm angry. Ah! Instead of saying I'm so mad, say you're so amazing. But it's, I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> Super nice. I had a little kid. He just like he changed his word once. He used to say, you're so amateur. And now uh, he say, you're so amazing. <laughs> and he get mad. <laughs> Super nice. <laughs> See that for my kids. Well, that <laughs> yeah, you can try it. <laughs> I will say that you keep doing the same thing. And get the, like, the student teacher more involved in the like, take of the over weeks classes. Like take more. Because I was afraid of the of one week, but now I want like three weeks more. <laughs> <laughs> because you get better and better, and yeah, yeah, I agree with them. Like that part of uh, of really getting into the the field of education and being like being teachers, not only being that observer or that assistant. Like that, I think that's part of the most important like the most important part of the program and also like the way that it has been connected with the university, like the class we have been taking, yeah. it like you choose it for us and it has been amazing. Like for me it has been like very interesting and I think that's great too. And yeah, I think everything's great. Yeah. Sure. I have a question. I just want to say thank you for, for all that you've done. And I think seeing the connection you've had with your teachers and your host family says a lot about who you are as young women. And I know I'm sure the students have, have had a fantastic time learning from you guys, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Emma had a question. 
Uh, did you ever get frustrated by the language barrier, and how did you overcome that? The hand helped. <laughs> I remember oh, I need a stapler and I went to the office and I said I need eight <laughs> and I understand myself but beside that I don't think so well it, it was difficult times with that but my teacher always said oh it has like a smile and she said, you, they will understand you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Keep going. And I just say, okay. And, <laughs> and I learn more. Yeah. I don't think I have ever been frustrated with language, but I've, like, sometimes when I don't have the word and I know what I want to say, I'm like, I know something that is this, but it's not this. <laughs> like, and then, like, it is easy because people understand that it's not your main language. And... Like, by the first time I emailed Deb, that is my host mom, she, I was like, oh, sorry if I don't spell something right. And she was like, no, don't worry. You speak two languages. I only speak one. <laughs> and then, like, I've always felt sometimes to get to improve my, like, my writing, my, my fluency and talking and all that. But then she made me realize, like, actually, it's not that important. Like, I can get to communicate. And that's, like, that's the most important thing of all. So... Okay. I think you're off the hook. <laughs> that means you're all set. <laughs> so we have a we have a, a a little bit of a transition here in that we're moving into, and you're absolutely welcome to stay. But we do like to give um, an opportunity if you have planned to only be here this long. Um, we, we have like about a minute or so that. Um, we will give you to um, decide, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. We'll start our second part. of student-centered learning, and um, board members have had this shared with them earlier, and, and I made reference to it in our earlier session so that you had it available to take a look at. Um, and this was uh, essentially created and vetted and uh, discussed and worked through all of our instructional staff and all of the schools. Um, the student-centered learning plan basically lays out a plan of continuous improvement to reach the four long-term goals. Uh, the second sheet that you have is the one-page um, document that lays out the four long-term goals and then in the bullets beneath each goal 
are the targets that have been incorporated uh, into this 24-month student-centered plan. Uh, tonight, we're only going to be updating you on goals one and two. And while structures and programs vary considerably, as they should across the spectrum of all of these grade levels that we have here, there are some clear improvement themes that I think that you'll be hearing to in tonight's reports from each of the schools and from, and from uh, the special services. So here's goal one. And um, in order to advance uh, towards achieving this particular goal that's up there, which is I, I count as sort of our fundamental and sort of our core goal, um, over the next many months, we need to continue to make progress in clearly articulating what we expect students to learn, and not only what we expect them to learn, but what we expect them to be able to do across all of the content areas. While we make better use of formative and summative data and assessment data, we need to also deepen our confidence that we are making database decisions to guide what's happening in terms of teaching and learning here in the Scarborough schools. All the while, we need to tackle the obstacle of time. We need more learning time, more time for our students, but also more time for our teachers, our instructional staff, and our professionals. If you take a look at goal two, in order to make strides that we need to make in this goal, the behavioral programs, the supports, the interventions and resources need to be enhanced to truly address the needs of all of the students who walk through our doors every day. Our effort, efforts across the district need to be well honed and coordinated to maximize the efficiency of our delivery of services. And we need to understand that the success of our teaching and learning culture depends on shared accountability, not only taken by our teachers and our learners and our parents, um, but also by community members. There's an extensive shared responsibility that we all have in, pr in producing the desired outcomes that we uh, want to produce for students and that we need to produce for students in order for them to have successful careers and in life. I'm going to um, uh, ask uh, the speakers who will speak to each of the phases up here, maybe to just come on up and um, because I, I think we'll be moving through these fairly quickly. We'll, we will start with K2. And um, so Kelly, come on up too, uh, because we, we'll just go right through this transition fairly quickly. Yeah. And Barbara? Okay, so for K2, um, under goal one, I think we're extremely fortunate to have such a rigorous and rich curriculum in place with the uh, math and focus and the units of study for reading and writing that reading that we're piloting, but writing that we're implementing. Um, I think that those programs have very clear and rigorous goals embedded in them. Teachers know them. Our next step is, is teaching teachers to communicate those goals very clearly to students in student-friendly language. Uh, using a lot of I can statements, I can multiply two digit numbers, and you know those kinds of statements where you're you're saying what you can do in the curriculum and not just I know my multiplication facts, I know I can rotely memorize them. Um, so we're 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 taking the next step from what the teachers know about the curriculum to trying to put it in student friendly language so the students can tell can know what they're doing and why they're doing it and communicate that not only to their teacher but to their peers, to their parents, um, which makes our student-centered instruction that much more valuable and more effective. And one of the ways that we've done that is to start incorporating um, students into our parent-teacher conferences. This was the first fall, was our first time to um, require students to be a part of the conferences and we asked teachers to go slowly and just have a small portion for that for them. It was a change for teachers to go from this is what your child has done for the first nine weeks of school to let's set some goals for your child. This is where I see where your child is and this is where we want your child to be and how are we going to get there. And for students to be a part of that and to own their learning and to take responsibility for it. 
Um, and that naturally brings us to um, positive behavior programs because you can't learn if you're not in a safe and, and welcoming environment. So one of the things we've worked on for, for several years now at the K2 phase especially is, is having a school-wide positive behavior plan which teaches children specifically what we mean when we say be safe in school, what that looks like, what that sounds like, what that feels like. We model it, we teach it, we practice it all throughout the year. Um, so I think that having kids not just saying be good, but knowing what that means and, and making that quantifiable is really important for kids. So they can then teach kindergartners, second graders can teach kindergartners, this is what it looks like to be safe in the hallway. This is what it looks like to be safe in the lunchroom. This is how we use the playground safely. So they can then teach it as well. Um, so I think that's, um, it really, again, lends students taking ownership of their school, ownership of their behavior, ownership of their learning, and that's where we're going to get the most bang for our buck. You'll notice some really similar themes at Wentworth. So um, with regard to clear and rigorous learning goals across the curriculum, we, um, in addition to what Ann had mentioned um, and similar across the district, we're engaged in a deeper study of the art and science of teaching. Um, last year we did a, a broad sweep um, book study as a staff and this year we're really delving into that um, clear and rigorous learning goals in the same place that um, K2 is with We've, um, we've identified what these goals are, but how do we really clearly communicate them to students and how do we help the students take more um, ownership and understanding of their goals? Um, we have access to a lot of data, um, STAR and Children's Progress and our curriculum-based measures that we have um, at Wentworth. And through this work, we're really exploring ways to engage students um, to take ownership of their learning and reflect on their progress as well. One way we're exploring, for example, um, is to um, have students reflect and implement through, throughout their work um, a digital portfolio that can move along with them to the middle school that really will um, leverage our great technology uh, that we now have access to at Wentworth. Um, under goal two, like Ann was mentioning previously, um, at Wentworth we are the next step in the developmental phase, so we focus on the respect guidelines and we have that really solidly in place at, um, at Wentworth and it's an acronym for Responsible, Encouraging, Safe, Polite. And that's the framework for the positive behavior expectations at school. We do um, explicitly teach what that looks like and help the students understand that. What we want to do is further explore how to strengthen the connection to that strong foundation that they build at the K2 phase level and then talk about how does this, um, this work transfer to the middle school as well, so connections between the phases. And then finally, consistent with the themes that we mentioned in goal two and in response to, as Dr. Entwistle mentioned, the community dialogue, we heard really clearly from students that they wanted more access to allied arts um, at, in school, so we um, are really excited about our expanded access to allied arts through an enrichment program that we developed this year. Um, with some flexibility and a lot of collaboration and some creative scheduling, the um, students have increased access to a series of monthly wellness allied arts classes um, that they're just loving this uh, expanded session with some really outside the box activities. And this win-win has also simultaneously afforded the classroom teachers some really precious grade level planning time. So we're excited about that work continuing as well. All right, so the middle school. Um, goal one. We have been working really hard on um, really taking a look at our learning goals and measuring those learning goals. So now we are at a point where we want to um, really take a look at our grading practices. We're using another book study called 15 Fixes. And as we're learning to measure those learning goals and having students also um, assess their own learning, we are looking at better ways to share that learning with, um, with parents. And as we're doing that, we are looking at pulling out the habits of work out of the grade stream and having it look really different and reporting to parents very differently about how well students are 
doing the work of, of learning. Um, along with that, um, goal two, I'm going to just move to goal two. We, this data plan that we're working on really crosses absolutely everything that we're doing in goal one and goal two. Um, we have a strong RTI uh, program in place that uses um, our data. Teachers are all involved in using data to get to know their students better and assess their learning. So that really brings us to goal two. Um, we ha are really focusing on um, fostering relationships, both within, within, do you want me to touch something? Huh. All right, I will keep going. Well, yeah. I'm going to just keep going while Kelly works on it. Um, our focus is on shared responsibility. All, all staff um, working with all students, developing a, um, you got it? Okay. All right. Developing team time, a way to really get to know their students at all different levels, and continuing to develop our RISE program, which is an intervention program, Remediate, Improve, Stretch, and Excel. And that's where all teachers are working with all students in small groups using data to inform instruction. So we're going to continue to um, improve that work. And you'll see that that is the same kind of work that the high school, I think, will be sharing. Um, and as you can see, things are really uh, moving along between buildings. Good evening. At the high school, we have um, for years at the high school and district level been talking about student-centered learning focus. <coughs> and last year there was a K through 12 initiative, all phase levels, used stakeholder input to actually identify what does a student-centered learning focus mean for students, for leaders, for teachers, for parents. So we are using that guide that George showed earlier in the presentation to truly be a guide for us in all the work we do at the high school. And we think it has made a huge impact on, I believe it's this. Yeah, it is. I can hold that up there. Sorry. So that is instrumental and at the key of, of any of the work that we do now. We use that to guide work, whether it's creating a midterm exam schedule or working on our current curriculum, uh, assessments, anything we're doing as an organization, as a teacher, uh, as a school. That is key to, to the work that we're doing. So that's where we start. Um, at this point, we're also utilizing some much needed resource of time that was granted to us this year through one of the Late Start Wednesdays that we have. Um, our school uses that time along with our department time to align all of the curriculum with national and state standards. So as I mentioned to you last year when we talked about this, we really last year or in the last two years have put the leadership in place in all of our content areas and we have aligned what we needed to do for work and our school was poised and ready to do that work. We just needed the resource of time. Now that we have that resource of time, there are wonderful things happening in every content area when it comes to curriculum and aligning those to national and state standards. Each phase level excuse me, each content area is at a different phase in that process, but it's, it's very valuable work. Uh, at the same time, we have, uh, we're into our third year, uh, the end of my first year here using stake, stakeholder input, and then all of last year and the beginning of this year, we have been working on creating and implementing a new student-centered learning schedule. This is a huge task. We have tried to take the right steps uh, and progress in a way so that we weren't rushing and we were truly using a student-centered learning focus. Um, I'm happy to say that right now that schedule uh, is in its final stages. Uh, we have gotten input from content areas. We have committees that have representatives from each content area that are a part of all the planning. Um, uh, Emma and Lizzie have been instrumental in pulling in all kinds of student leadership into this process and getting probably the most important input, which is feedback from students on the scheduling model. This schedule um, will be finalized and decided upon by the end of this semester and we'll use the second semester this year for professional development to help our staff transition into what the schedule will be like for next year. 
Uh, embedded in that schedule are two really important components. We will have an academic support time embedded in the school day. where 35 minutes every single day, uh, except for late starts, will be time where all professional staff will be available for students to get <coughs> academic support. So in a community and a school that has students who are constantly busy, before school, after school, with all they do, oftentimes they haven't had that time if they don't have a study hall to get that academic support. That's embedded in this new schedule. Uh, an advisory program is going to be created, and so there will be 10 to 12 students that will have one advisor for four years for another connection, another adult to support them during their experience. So uh, all of that is tied to goal number one. Uh, and as I dovetail into goal number two, I just mentioned um, Emma and Lizzie and their, their significant input as students. We are working very hard at ensuring that we get the stakeholder input in our improvement efforts where it needs to be. So we have a decision-making process that's tied to being transparent, consistent, and empowering whoever should be a part of that decision. And so this new schedule is a good example of that, um, using student leaders like Emma and Lizzie and using the content area leaders and getting input from all those stakeholders and then combining that with input from district leadership and parents in the community. We think we're going to have a, a better improvement effort regardless of what we're working on. Part two in that goal would be the collaboration with other phase levels. Barbara mentioned that. Um, that work that I mentioned that are happening in content areas on curriculum, our high school staff that have worked with the middle school and other phase levels have found this to be hugely successful, very rewarding. We're trying to vertically align what we do um, in those areas. And as a lot of you know with a proficiency-based diploma, a middle school student might take some courses that they'll end up being able to have work toward their graduation standards to enable them to complete some of those standards prior to coming to high school. So it's key that we're collaborating with all phase levels. And then finally, the last piece would be the implementation of this uh, performance evaluation and professional growth model. We are trying to embed that in all of our work, in high school level work, in our district PLT work, um, in the feedback we give our staff to help improve instructional strategies. The new PEPG that's district-wide has been hugely instrumental the eye observation, I think, is a really valuable resource for us. So for goals one and two, that's my standard <coughs> for the high school. Thank you. Good evening. I think I'll be briefer. Um, for goal number one, uh, for special services, uh, there are, are three primary areas that we looked on. Uh, I'm going to speak directly to the study skills curriculum. We, um, we've all been teaching K through 12 uh, different forms of study skills throughout the years using different resources, uh, but we, we really need to make it more of a focused content area of its own in its own curriculum. Um, study skills, habits of work, executive functioning, all those things mean the same. Helping kids to learn how to learn, how to think, and how to produce. So at the high school, we are in year two of um, offering a study skills workshop as an elective credit for special education students. And there was a staff PLT meeting uh, group that worked last year in revising the rubric. A student and staff um, measured rubric to increase the uh, performance and the accountability in the, in the skills. So we're in year two of that model at the high school with a new rubric. At the middle school this year, we are piloting a new curriculum um, resource. We are also piloting a new model. Um, so that is happening right now at um, the resource room and social life skills programs with students who have this particular need on an IEP. But Barbara and I are sharing these curriculum materials and are broadening it to um, well, a new name of the study center, but it is a curriculum that we're looking to implement throughout the entire middle school. Um, and then next year, K-5, we'll be looking at resources to pilot at that phase as well. So very exciting work. Um, we, uh, I'll, I'll just go down to goal two. You can see the other areas in goal one. Uh, you've heard from um, most buildings about the importance of their positive behavior systems school-wide. And we um, are so appreciative that uh, the board and the community um, approved a second behavioral specialist for the district. 
So that has um, increased the impact that we can have on all students. So there are really um, three focus points for these two positions. One is meeting the needs of a student that isn't responding to the school-wide program, those individual needs. So the behavioral spe specialist is consulting with the teacher, doing observations, creating positive plans, training staff to implement the plans, training staff on how to collect the data and how to analyze the data to make adaptions in the plans, as well as running one-on-one, -on -one, two-week programs of, of discrete trial training. So the whole range. So that, that's a significant amount of time. But our focus this year beyond that is actually developing resources for all, all staff working with students in their classroom. So myself and the behavioral specialists have met or are scheduled to meet with every phase's multidisciplinary team. Uh, the multidisciplinary team is a process in a school that uh, a teacher, a staff member, refers the student because they have concerns. They've tried some things, they have some worries, they need some additional uh, help on how to meet the needs of the student. So we are doing training about how to figure out what is the purpose of the behavior, and when you know that, there are very clear um, ideas of interventions that would work. So we've done a training for all of the special education staff in the district. We've done uh, meetings and crosswalks at the MDTs, and then at each phase, we've mapped out a plan for the rest of the year. For example, at K2, there's been a presentation for all staff at K2. Um, at Wentworth, we are now building a, um, a team, a, a school resource, a behavioral resource team. So we're uh, doing training for the entire MDT and the, and the lead, lead teachers. And so that's going up through the middle school and the high school. So very exciting, getting kids really ready to learn again. So I could keep talking, but I'll stop. Okay, at Central Office, um, our efforts have been to understand the K-12 standards for graduation are not just for um, the high school. It is really a K-12 effort, as you can, uh, as you've heard, coming up from uh, the primary that we are all looking at standards. And while working on these K-12 standards, we are developing a culture for data that we are looking at, but to ensure that the data is ready to ensure uh, student progress. And this will also uh, depend on increased learning time. That is our goal one. Um, when we looked at goal two, we have made great strides to foster collaboration across the phase level environments, as you heard from the K-12, while building a culture of all adults in the district and the community feeling a shared sense of responsibility and producing outcomes that we feel that would benefit all students in our school system. Um, everyone has stayed up here, I um, presume, because they think that um, they are, are ready and available for questions. Um, I, let me just uh, hit the summary button here. Um, I, I think uh, the short uh, message is that uh, there's much that's been accomplished on this plan, um, and there is much more uh, that really remains to be done. Um, I did want to let you know that there's a new dashboard of uh, progress monitoring that will be introduced. We are using metrics on all of the um, uh, student-centered uh, student, uh, uh, plans, st student-centered learning plans uh, for all of the phases and the uh, d departments that have reported out here. Um, but we've struggled with a way to really present that in um, an understandable fashion. And as a dashboard is on your car, it can give, it can tell you how much gas do you have, is the heat right, um, you know, are the lights working and so on. Um, we've created a, a new dashboard that basically allows us to look at each phase of the plan, each part of the plan, and really look at the targets that we're working on in all of the areas and see what our current status is. Um, it is also a section for really thinking about the organizational strategies and rethinking about the organizational strategies that we're using to really achieve those targets. So um, we have a very talented team of uh, technology integrators. They have been my consultants on this project. I think I just had my 
third and final meeting with them, they produced an awesome um, rendition of a dashboard that we uh, that I had located, and uh, it was very complicated. They've now Google Googleified it, I guess if, that, if that's a word, um, and so that it's very easy to use. And uh, Kelly and and uh, Cheryl are basically uh, the two that will take on the training responsibilities in central office, and then they'll be working with the staff uh, for each of the folks out in the schools to really help them. Uh, get access to that uh, dashboard and to be able to, you know, what we want and what we've always wanted is a plan that's a living and breathing plan. It's not like volumes. It's not three ring binders that collect dust. It's really a plan that we recognize we need to be constantly adjusting what our strategies are. And we want to be able to do that and do that easily and actually track the thinking that we've had as we've attacked uh, that work. Um, I think uh, up here, uh, in summary, it, it does say that, that there are certainly um, a number of challenges that we have and we've continued to have um, and likely will continue to have. And that has to do with um, adequate and appropriate resources, um, including the time uh, that's needed, um, the financial resources, and the human resources. But I'm speaking to the Scarborough Board of Education, and I don't think I'm telling you anything that you don't already know. But I think it's important to recognize that the work that's being done, incredible work, um, and, the, and these are the leaders, but there's, there's that whole other um, you know, group of, of staff, faculty, professionals, instructional staff, and so on, who are out there really driving this work and, um, and having adequate time, having adequate financial resources, and having um, certainly financial, I mean, uh, adequate human resources is essential to getting the work done. Um, I think lately I've been talking more about uh, a striking a balance between the effort that we're um, investing, um, ut utilizing the available resources that we have in the right way, um, and recognizing that the balance is between doing that um, and potentially getting overloaded. And there, it's, a, it's a fine line, um, and I don't necessarily think it's always been a fine line, but I do think that it is a fairly fine line now, particularly because um, we have so many very critically important initiatives that are happening across the whole district, everyone, and it's, it's really being led by these folks who are on the leadership council leading a building or leading a department, but as well, they are also leading these initiatives. So we've, we've all got um, a, a finger in multiple, in multiple pots, and, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, the fact that we, um, we get dangerously close to losing our focus, we need to step back and, and find that focus, we get dangerously, dangerously close to losing a sense of coherency in that work. We have to step back. And, um, and the reason for that is, is because, and, and I think that's in an effort really to balance um, that effort, that energy that's being invested, using the resources in the right way and, and making sure that we don't get overloaded. And um, so I think that, um, you, you know, I, I will leave with the top statement again. You know, much has been accomplished. Much more remains to be done. The work that's ongoing is incredible um, by these leaders and by their respective staff. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, we've been able to count on the advocacy of the board to, to, to really push for those resources. Um, and, and we certainly are very appreciative of that. Um, I guess the news is we're not going to ask you to stop pushing because um, it's needed. Um, we, we have a tremendous momentum that's, that's going and moving and, and really making changes for kids. And we know that there's a whole lot um, that is on our pathway uh, that's going to do even more for kids. And, and, um, and, and that's where we really need the support um, and the sort of shared buy-in, the shared accountability uh, that extends right out through this organization and out into the community. So, um, if you have any questions for any of the particular uh, presenters, principals, or anything in general around the themes that we've uh, presented, and m maybe I'll just go back to those themes. Don't get dizzy. Jackie. How do you measure uh, that students are understanding their learning, why they are learning it, and can describe their learning goal and track their progress, and 
carrying that one step further, how do you quantify and report that? Parents want to know something. So uh, much of what we do when we deal with uh, what we call common grading rubrics, um, first I'll start with it's really important that a classroom teacher makes it very clear to students what the learning objectives are, what the goals are, um, how to learn that, and then how it's going to be measured, and what does constitute, whether you get a certain grade or you've shown proficiency in some standard, how you show that proficiency. Commonly, that's done with rubrics. So our content areas work on creating rubrics that will define that, but one of our content, two of our content areas are doing something in addition to that. So metacognitively, you want a student to be able to understand how they learn. Are they learning? Um, and so we have some departments that are creating uh, that same type of rubric for students to assess how they think they've done after an assignment or during an assignment. So they, some of the math classes, you two might have been in a math class that did this last year. Um, they will try to uh, score themselves and determine how they learned or what they think they did. And then when they get the feedback from the teacher, they use that to start to learn how they learn best and did they really understand what they thought they understand and what do they need to do to truly learn the best way they do because as we know all learners have different learning styles. So not only are we, are, are we coming up with rubrics that will define what you have to learn and whether you've learned it, but we're trying to help students learn how they learn best and be able to work with that as well. So there's not one set standard that accomplishes all of that, but we have content areas that are working on common rubrics for both those areas. So at the high school, we're in the developmental stage of that piece. Um, and as we grow that, we will educate parents in the community on how that's going to impact their children's grades. So they do, in fact, receive a grade. Yes. Yeah. Under our current format, some classes are just grades. Some classes have had um, goals set for them, learning objectives that have been tied to specific standards, and they've been measured on that as well. Um, each, as you know, in school, each, especially at high schools, we don't have one set grading policy for every single teacher in every single course in every single department. That's basically those content areas come up with that, and teachers have the professional responsibility to create a grading policy that have assessments to meet all the different types of learners. So it's a responsibility of the individual teachers at the beginning of the year to communicate that to students. Here's how you're assessed. This is what you need to do to prepare for those assessments. These are the supports you'll have in place. All of those things are done on an individual teacher basis, but coordinated in each content area. So you know, I think that you would get a different kind of answer from our, our K-2, even, even middle school. Um, I'm not sure who of you wants to kind of contrast in terms of... So just quickly at the middle school, we do have some teachers that are starting to uh, measure student learning using four-point rubrics. So really, um, Marzano uh, recommends using scales for our kids. So. In those students taking world language right now, they are all measured on a four-point rubric. They know exactly what the learning goal is. They know what they have to do to be a two, to be a three, or to be at the top of the scale of four. That would be more innovating. Um, they have opportunities to move on that scale. So if they take an assessment, if they, if they show that they're a two and they're not happy with that, they know they can be a three, which is meeting the standard, then they have many opportunities to meet that three. What does that mean to the parents? How do you, <laughs> you explain I gave, a, I gave okay. a school board okay. member some homework the other day. Yes, and I have your book in my bag with me. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. She had to learn, read a book to find out how her child was doing in school. Yes, no. sort of. <laughs> it's, it's hard, I think, it's harder for parents to, to certainly that's why I'm asking the question. Right, relearn this sort of grading. Mm -hmm. And I will fully admit that I'm a, you know, 93 to 100 is an A, 88 to 92 is a B. 
that's my mindset. But and your I mindset is changing, isn't it? It's now changing, and I need to adapt because I'm projecting it onto my poor child. <laughs> so let's take it one step farther. What's it going to look like on the transcript when they're preparing for college? Okay, so we don't know that yet. Do, you do don't we? know yet. We do not know. Holy moly. That's what we're well, working on. There are, there are multiple models. Mm -hmm. models okay. okay. So some models are the same grading. They have a parallel piece. They have the regular grading policy so that standard grading practices, colleges continue to understand that. But at the same time, they lift the standards of proficiency that students have met for graduation. So there's some schools that are doing both. Some are trying to go just to show proficiency and standards. Some are staying with grades. It's all over the place in the state. It's much more informative to a college to know mm -hmm. what the kid uh, can do rather than what an A looks like in this high school versus an A in that high school. And, and what what is actually the level of rigor um, against which this student was measured in terms of both their their content knowledge and uh, their skill. So it's it's a it's a it's a Jackie if you're kind of like trying to make that crosswalk, everybody is, I think. Well it, my problem is this. And it's the same one that I that I expressed multiple times over the course of a school year. I want to make absolutely certain I know the students understand it, and I know the staff understand it. I want to make absolutely certain that the parents of these children understand what's happening. And point, case in point, if Jody doesn't truly understand <laughs> not seriously, there's here is an educated person who is totally involved in the education of her children. If she doesn't truly understand what we're trying to do and how we're trying to report the progress, then we're in serious trouble. I don't think we're in serious trouble, but as it's being explained, it's not easy to understand. Well, we're in lots of different places. Okay. Teachers are learning, we're learning, we're trying to figure it out, and we will be involving parents, and we're trying to train, uh, teach parents and kids. It's, it's a long process. Okay. I, I suspect I know the teacher that you're going to be talking about your experience with, Kelly, and, um, and I think that you can completely explain how it works, right? So, in parent-teacher conferences, the teachers do a very good job um, explaining, in my experience anyway, explaining, you know, this is an example of, of some work your students have done. And they'll show, like, we just had ours yesterday, three writing pieces over the last three months. And the rubric for each one. And it's very clear when you see it presented, this is the rubric, this is what was supposed to be, you know, the, the goal of the assignment. So, for instance, I happen to know somebody who needs to work on conventions a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and that person, and it particularly, is about paragraph structure. It's right there in the rubric. If he just, this he anonymous she. person, <laughs> he or she had just gotten a, you know, a minus on it, he, no, the, the student or the parent wouldn't know exactly like, what, where are we going? What's the goal? What are we working on for the next writing assignment? I love rubrics. I, I mean, the four-point scale is a little bit hard to get used to as far as like, because everyone's driven for an A or a 99 or a 100. Four. But four, four right. And but five, now four. it's a four. And it's, but it's, it's okay not. because you have to just, you have to see that there's, that even though there's fewer spots you land on a scale, <coughs> it tells you more because the rubric really is so clear. I mean, it's so clear and it's so more detailed than just, here's the assignment, did you do it, check yes or no. I mean, this is very, it's involving the student, it's involving the parent, I think, when you, because this anonymous student happens to bring home rubrics, the homework on Monday, so the rubric is part of the homework packet, so everybody knows up front here are the expectations. Here's how you're going to get a competent. Here's how you're going to get a strong. So you know up front, this is how it's going to work. This is how you're going to get a four. If you want a four, make sure you can check each of those categories along the way. 
I'm, I'm not trying to criticize what we're doing. I'm trying to make absolutely certain that the parents of these children know what we're doing. And they will. Hmm. It's a process, Jackie. We're moving through that process. We're, le we're, we're all learning as well. So, last we had a report about the state with the proficiency base. They've, it's been flip-flopped several times. So, at what point right now are we at for our students? What grade level right now? So, is it the seventh graders right now that will have to have the proficiency proficiency based diploma? Yes. Okay. So the last one was the eighth. It's the eighth graders. If I'm not mistaken, the current eighth graders will be the first class to graduate with the proficiency base. I thought that got pushed back. Oh, got pushed again, back a year. Right. So, okay. I was just and trying to determine. And likely will be pushed down. Well, I was kind of thinking that. So. Okay, but we're just moving forward. We're Whether moving at the pace that we believe to be the right good for us. Yeah. Okay. Right and that's yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I I'm really excited to hear all of those, and I and I really especially love hearing a shift from evaluation to assessment. I think that's really fantastic. Um, to my untrained ear, it sounded like a lot of the assessment was focused on skills within a content area, and I wonder to what degree dispositions are also part of that assessment plan? Who's talking about how does work? That was very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are what in fact... Yeah, I, I don't know if All right, so our goal is to pull out at least one habit of work for second semester, and that will be a lot of parent feedback and contact about that. Can you explain what you mean by so habit I have, work? So it... All right, we have... I will just give you an example. So a student who hands work in late right now, it usually they're dinged on their final grade. Right, ladies? Yes. Well, that's a habit of work. Some kids need more time. We need to look at that differently. That will come out <coughs> of the grading stream. That will be a separate report to parents. And if a student needs more time, they're late with work, that is a separate mm, comment or information for parents, but it doesn't affect their grade. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about things like engagement? Is there a way to sort of assess that as well? Absolutely. There's a lot to talk about. I gave you something simple. That's much more difficult. <coughs> but on your radar screen? Yes, absolutely. Right. Other schools are doing it. So we are, you, it's a high performing school. So we are looking at what other schools are doing also. And it's those things that, that uh, uh, people are looking for in their workers. Collaborative. Yeah. Right. Good communication, problem solving. So it's actually more important in the, in the long time. Mm -hmm. And other. Um. So <coughs> this is amazing work. It's just very impressive. It's extremely detailed. Um, and you know, I, I have like three or four questions I could ask you on particular things like RTI and variety mm -hmm. of different things that you're all working on. But rather than do that, mm -hmm. um, would would you each call out what is the number one thing that you see coming down the line towards February and March that you want and need from the school board and from this community? You want to pick it up on the, on the microphone, so you, you just... Time. Time for teachers to collaborate more, to be able to do it thoughtfully, regularly, um, frequently, and not all in one day in this month, and six months later, all one day in another month. It's it has to be regular, it has to be frequent, and it has to be not rushed. Um, so that's, that's what we would need. Anybody need anything different? Oh, yeah, Dave needs something different. He needs more. <laughs> more than everybody else. More than everybody else. Nice teammates. <laughs> Uh, at, at the high school level, I can't speak to the other phase levels, but at the high school level, uh, I just came back from a seminar with my school leadership and our two co-facilitators for our steering committee for the NEASC self-study that begins next year. We right now, um, we had an opportunity to share a lot of the work that's currently happening at our school. They made it very clear to us that the work that's currently happening in our school and the professional development time that we use on Late Start Wednesdays in our department time 
has to continue. It is the, those are the things that our school is supposed to be working on. The self-study that we're going to embark on next year is another form of professional development. We're examining what the school does, how we do our business, is it student-centered, do we have everything in place we should have in place for students to be successful. They made it very clear that's additional professional development that should not push aside the existing work that we're doing. The high school will also need the resource of additional time. And this professional development isn't just for next year. Once we've gone through the self-study process and done what we should be doing as a school, we will then take the results of that and we will use that to guide us in a two to five year plan and then work the following year on putting together a plan to implement what we've learned from our self-study. So we're making great use of our current time, but this additional time that we're going to have to have for the self-study has to be put in place as another opportunity for professional development with uh, our school and what we're currently trying to do. So that's a little bit different than my colleague had said. That's why I stepped up and stepped up. So the school board is going to announce in just a couple of minutes the creation of an advisory committee for the that's going to um, look at the calendar and look at the new school start times and new, that kind of thing. Um, it's going to be imperative that you cl bring clarity for that committee to understand why the need is so great. Just <coughs> the everyday parents who are going to join that committee, community members, are going to need to really understand and the work you're doing is, um, you know, very complex, and so that, that's hard for average people to just understand what the big deal is when you're going to affect my schedule. So if you together can come up with something that just gives a synopsis and makes it clear as, as much as you can to provide input to that committee, and we'll be asking some of you to join that committee anyways, but. I think together, you know, that's going to be really important because, you know, some of us are, are, are it's a little bit clearer too, but it's really hard to get that out there into our, you know, into our community so people can really get it of how important this is. I'm going to add just one thing that is different from what everything else that we've talked about. Little school needs space. We are struggling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody have anything to tell us? Other questions from the board? You sure? What other questions do you have? You asked it that way. <laughs> you have any answers? It's like, okay, we're all set. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On the agenda here is the announcement of a new advisory group. Um, the chair of that committee will be uh, Kelly Murphy, and Carrie Lyford will be joining her in that work. So in, in this committee, um, we're looking for some people who are interested in both the topic of the school calendar, which will be the first item to address, since we need to have a uh, calendar uh, come forth to the school board uh, as early in February as February 4th as possible. And so that committee will be, you know, charged with that right on, right away. Then the uh, additional topic will be to, to talk about um, the changes to a possible change in school start times as we understand the information that we have received regarding the importance of our middle and high school students starting school later. Um, so that same committee would then begin to look at the research and understand and express that information to the community. 
So we're looking for between 20 and 30 people who will join this committee. And that would be composed of some citizens in the community, some um, school staff members and administrators who would come across from the K-12 uh, span so that we have input from all the stakeholders. And even within the citizens coming from the community, we will be looking for, again, across the grade levels, if they have children in the school system, then we would, would like representation from all K-12 levels. Mm -hmm. um, we'll also be seeking students to be on this advisory panel. So uh, that may be something, you know, the two of you are interested in. Uh, it may be somebody else, I'm not sure. It's, you know, it's up to you and your own time schedules. Um, so with that, basically within the community, we're asking people who have an interest in this to email to Kelly Johnston at uh, the superintendent's office, and you can do that by going on the uh, school's website and just emailing directly to the superintendent's um, administrative assistant. And that's Kelly Johnston again at Scarborough, it's Johnston at scarboroughschools.org, easily found on the school website. Um, is there anything I forgot in that, Kelly? Did you want to say anything further? Um, our hope is that committee is going to sit and meet very quickly. So uh, we would want to hear from people uh, right away following this evening's meeting. We will be posting that on the uh, Scarborough School Board's website, Board of Education, so that you can be informed about it. And we'll look forward to having those names very quickly so that we can get right up and running uh, right immediately after Thanksgiving. Okay, anything else? Yeah, I just want to compliment our school board member who was in the play last mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to stand up and do a song and dance? Oh, right? uh, no, I have not warmed up a can of The yeah. play was, uh, if you didn't see the play, you really miss a great one. Mm -hmm. And she did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. You can always come next year. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. So that would bring us right to 7.0. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? Thank you good. all. We are Thank you. Thank you.